Stephen, we're both uh, backgrounds of kitchen furniture and obvious question to ask you today first, which is better, a British made kitchen or a European made kitchen? I think for sustainability purposes, I'm going to have to say buy in the UK, buy from a UK manufacturer because that will help us live a more sustainable life. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I think the, the qualities of kitchens are, are very similar through Europe and the UK. Uh, I think we tend to be a bit more traditional. Um, I love the UK traditional kitchens, mm. but I also love the the, 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 the cinematics, the pog and poles, the bolt outs. Mm. I like the modern kitchen, so mm. probably for me it would be traditional with a modern twist. Right. And because I like to live a sustainable life, okay. I'm going to buy it all in the UK. Okay. You mentioned sustainability, which is massive in today's market for consumers asking questions coming into the showroom. So apart from the fact we know that KUKA taps are water saving, energy efficient and save time, how do you as a business try to educate your retailers on conveying that message? Yeah, that, that, that is a challenge. So we look at the wider messaging. So again, um, I'm very fortunate that we, the product we sell is a sustainable product. Mm. Uh, it wasn't invented for those reasons. Mm. So in 2006, when it was invented, it was invented for speed, okay. time saving. So, so a byproduct of what we've invented is it's sustainable. So we're really fortunate with that. Uh, so as you, you touch on our product, saves water, saves energy. Um, I'd like to see the industry embrace a simple sustainability cell. Mm. For me, it's really complex. We mm. talk about emissions, global warming, mm. ice melting, um, rainforest disappearing. Mm. And to the average man or female in the street when buying a kitchen, does that mean anything to them? The fact that it's come from a managed rainforest or, or the company's planted another tree because you've got a wooden door. Mm. I'd le like to see us sell sustainability is a story with the kitchen so yeah if you install a, a boiling tap mm. it's more efficient and safer than a kettle mm. but you could also say that about your washing machine your dishwasher your all your other appliances um, waste how do we deal with waste in the kitchen I think as an industry we we need to look at sustainability mm. we need to translate it into a simple argument that a customer can relate to mm. and understand um, because for me, if you invest sustainably, mm. you're generally going to save money. Mm. Sometimes the capital cost mm. might be a little bit more. Yeah. So I think the duty of the, of the retailer or, or the person selling it is to explain to the customer that, yes, you're buying this product and, yeah. it, and it might be a little bit more expensive than this one. However, over the next two years, mm. you're going to save X, Y and Z mm. because you've invested in this. Mm. So your investment will be recouped. Do you think consumers, Stephen, are asking more of those questions? I think... Yeah, we'd be, we're super lucky as an industry, aren't we? I, I remember in the dark moments of COVID, March the 24th, 2020, when Boris shut us down. Yeah. And I remember those 14 weeks vividly. Yeah. Uh, March the 24th to June the 14th. And my business went from doing amazing business to nothing. And I thought, wow, we've got a problem. And then June the 14th came and we opened up. And as an industry, we ended up in a boom. I mean, who could have predicted in the darkest moments of COVID mm. that we would have supply short, the demand would outstrip mm. supply, it, un mm. unbelievable. Mm. And yet again, I find with the cost of living crisis, mm. everybody's suddenly been told that mm. be sustainable, mm. turn your heating off, don't boil your kettle. Mm. We're talking in a language that people now understand and because it affects them financially and mm. there's a pound put against the value of the item you're using, it, it's raised awareness. So I think yeah. we're really, really fortunate. Again, in a crisis like the cost yeah. of living, yeah. it's, it's enabling us as an industry yeah. to talk about being sustainable. And as a consequence, you can persuade people to invest, mm. to become more sustainable and save money. Yeah, so let's say the average household, their electric bill's gone up 600 pound in a year. So what can KUKA do to support that household? Yeah, that, 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 that's difficult. I'd love to be able to help absolutely everybody, but, but I don't think we can. I think the, the, it's a really difficult situation and one that is upon, upon us straight away. Um, but I think we have to look at the way our properties are constructed, the way we renovate. Um, are our houses warm enough? 
Are they properly insulated? Our default mechanism is turn on the heating. Mm. Uh, for me, is that the best way to stay warm? Is, is it? Is it the best advice? Um, so I think we, we've got a, a lot of educating to do. Um, I think we're, we're in a crisis with not the best housing stock. Um, we're probably not as all knowledgeable as we should be on, on how we can improve our properties to make them warmer and be more efficient. But I think the crisis will wake us up to that. And I think the world after the cost of living crisis will be a different place. And I think we've got now got a consumer audience that is being told to invest in sustainable appliances uh, are concerned about heating and water. So I think it gives us an advantage. Is there a calculation, Stephen, that your sales team can give a retailer about the difference of what it would cost you to kettle for a whole year compared to a Kuka tap? Is there a calculation where you can illustrate there is a saving? Yeah, so we, we, the, 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 there is a calculation. We give an energy saving and, and we give um, Water saving, so energy with a cookie is saved because it's a vacuum flask. You're not boiling the kettle every time you boil it, um, and you save on energy. Energy cost is not significant in a household. You know, you might be talking about a kettle that costs £100 a year, right. and with a cooker, that will cost you half of that. Okay. So a cook will be £50 so a year. 50 so, you, so, yeah, so you'll save on your energy. However, the, the, the bigger savings are in water. Um, I know everybody talks about energy. Water is a finite commodity. Uh, what everybody tends to do is fill a 1.7 litre kettle for one cup of tea or coffee. So you overboil your water, overheat it. They then throw it away. So you're wasting your water. Reboiling water is really unhealthy. So the practice around the kettle, energy is something that we all talk about. Um, but a, a, a kettle is really inefficient, not only in terms of energy, but it's yeah. water. Yeah. Not to forget yeah. the safety aspects of it. It's yeah. the most dangerous appliance in the kitchen. Mm. Um, so it's... Um, I was going to ask that question, so if a customer comes in the showroom, if you put price to one side for one minute, what tends to be the second number one objection? Safety. Safety. Okay. This, it, is children, this is children in the household. Yeah, safety is really interesting um, because people will think about nothing other than boiling a 1.7 litre kettle right. with a cord on it, right. filling it with boiling water and leaving it on a tabletop where a kid can pull it off. There's about 350 serious children accidents a year right. with a kettle. Conversely, with a cooker, you can't throw it, you can't, any hot or boiling tap, so not even just cooker. If you talk about a method of delivering boiling or hot water from any of my competitors, it's far safer than that of a kettle, because it's coming from a tap. You can't scald a boiling tap, but people are naturally frightened of it. And it, it's something that we have to work on. Uh, and encourage people and persuade people that actually this is a safer way to deliver your water. Okay, so the safety record is exceptional? Yeah, you, 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 mm. it's impossible to injure yourself with a cooker right. because we, we deliver it in, in a fine spray. So we, we oxygenate the water as it hits the atmosphere, so it separates the water particles, which means that if you... Did splash? And, yeah, it will it be hot mm. and it will You'll feel it, but you, you naturally, you draw your hand away. Mm. With a kettle, what yes. happens is 1.7 litres of water falls on you. Mm. So if I throw 1.7 yeah. litres, yeah. you can do nothing. Mm. You're going to scold, you're going to burn. Mm. So by nature of the design, you cannot mm. scold or burn yourself with a kettle unless somebody forcibly held yourself hand under it. So there's the objection beta. Yes, that's it, it, it yeah. is, but it, it's, it's people understanding Understand. that in practice and, yeah. and understanding that's not a sales pitch, mm. but, it, but that is fact. That is fact, that is fact, and it always, yeah, it's always funny. I always look at kettles and when you boil them, you can't even touch the outside. Mm. They're so hot. So, yeah. Boil a kettle and try and touch it. Mm. And people come to me and say, is your tap safe? And I think, wow, have you, have you, have you looked at what you're using at the moment? Mm. So the market is moving on significantly. There's lots of new initiatives coming all the time. What do you think, Stephen, the, the future is for the kitchen market? Is it in terms of design, trends? Where do you see the market going end of next year? I think the, the, the kitchen area is developing. I, I don't think in terms of design we're going to see a, a, a light year leap in, in what's going to change in the kitchen in 2023. I think everybody's designs 
I, I think the design of the kitchen is fundamentally set. We understand how it works. I think there will be a I'd like to see a development. And I think there will be development in sustainable appliances. Okay. Um, I think okay. people will be looking to invest in, in those a little bit more. Mm. Um, waste. Mm. I look at how we deal with waste. Which you mentioned earlier. Yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, as a, when I was in the kitchen business, I always yeah. used to sell a waste disposal. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Every single kitchen, I always used to sell a waste disposal. Mm. And I would never be, there's two things I would never be out without now in my kitchen. Mm. Is, a, is a cooker boiling tap yeah. and a waste disposal. Yeah. North American market is standard in this market. It's it really are. Yeah. So, so for me, I think the development will be in more sustainable appliances. Mm but appliances that do a little bit more, uh, some more innovation. So I, I think, we, yeah, I think we'll see waste disposals. Yeah. I think they, they will become more in demand. Okay. Um, how we deal with waste so and technology. technology. Consumers may purchase or spend more money on more energy efficient appliances. Definitely. We, we, we've seen that from the start of the, the cost of living crisis. Yeah. The, the, the questioning we get at exhibitions or from our customers. And I often spend time in our showroom speaking to customers mm. and trying to understand how they heard about the brand, the product. Yeah. I find it really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the nature of those conversations has drifted from throwaway comments about energy and water saving. I think customers used to ask us about it, mm -hmm. but as, as just as a bit of peace of mind. Yeah. Now it's, it's probably the first, one, first question. Yeah. Is this gonna save me energy? Is yeah. this gonna save me water? Yeah. And, and how? And you get challenged on it. Yes. You get challenged yes. on it. How is it going to do that? Yeah. How? Mm. So, the, so the challenge for us is educating our dealers and yes. our partners yes. to be able to present this with confidence. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, so it, yeah. a lot more focus on it. It's a good opportunity. Amazing opportunity. Mm. Amazing. Mm. What can we see from KUKA over the coming years? What's the new initiatives from yourself, Stephen? Yeah, so I'm, I'm delighted to say that we've, we are introducing next year some new tap styles. Okay. So we've got some different finishes coming out next year with, with some different operations on the tap handle. So we're just trialing some different things. Okay. Um, we've invested in the technology below the work surface. So we're forever not as exciting for our customers, but we've recently launched a new tank, okay. new scale control. So all our component parts are replaceable so you send them back combating hard water areas yeah so we've got a scale control for combating hard water where we've made the cartridge recyclable so you send it back to us we've introduced a new swap system so if somebody's tank needs a repair or is faulty we do an exchange instead of sending it to landfill okay. um, so we see further development in making the product more sustainable um, more efficient better to use better to run yeah. Um, and we see the, the growth of the, the, the sector growing. What, although I've been doing this for 16 years now, mm. a hot or boiling tap is really new to this industry. Mm. Mm. So although I'm, I'm 16, 17 years in, mm. we're still giving the same messaging we did mm. back when I started. Mm. So for me, 2023 will be challenging. Mm. I think the cost of living crisis is going to, to make it a more difficult year, mm. but I don't think in the last 17 years I've ever had a year that hasn't been difficult, mm. be it financial crisis, Brexit, COVID, mm. I think as an industry we're used to dealing with it. Um, so I think it's gonna be a tough year, yeah. but I'm, I'm really excited by the spin that the cost of living crisis has put on sustainability. Mm. And I think if we embrace that yeah. as an industry, and learn how to sell mm. sustainably mm -hmm. in a simple way, mm. I think we can benefit from this environment. So throughout all those um, challenges over the last 10 years, let's say, because it's always something, isn't it? So how, how have you grown as much as you have? And why haven't your competitors? Um, I think it is, I think I'm truly blessed to have an amazing product. Um, I didn't invent it, um, and if I stand back from it, listen, I, I'm Kuka through and through, mm. but if I take myself out of Kuka and stand back, it's an amazing product, and, and the patents they have on it just mm. give it, they give it an edge, mm. but I think as a business, we, we want to be seen as different, so from our people, our culture, mm. um, the way we want to work, mm. we want to do it differently, mm. but the customer is centric to what we do. So every single decision we make, mm. be it 
my accounts go on the phone, uh, be it my lady in service, sorry I'm pointing at people that you're not all going to see, but they're all in here. Yeah. But I want those people, when they're making a decision or speaking to somebody, they think about the customer. So if you're a customer onto, we, we've got an issue with DPD today, they're, they're not delivering anything. So we'll have about 700 packages a game, mm. day go out. Mm. We come in this morning, DPD aren't going to deliver their packages. So what's the solution? What is the solution? Well, we're going to have a lot yeah. of angry customers. Mm and the, the, the difficulty mm. in the business that you can become frustrated mm. and what we try and do as business is put ourselves in the customer's place mm. and say okay I'm the customer I'm going to be really upset mm. that DPD haven't delivered mm. and I'm going to take that out on KUKA mm. so as a business we want to give a world-class service a service that we const constantly strive to improve mm. and to do that we put ourselves in the place of the customer every point we can mm and look to make that customer mm. happy. Mm. What happens when the customer isn't happy? What do you do? We're going to make them happy. You are not, mm. you're not going to deal with KUKA mm. and remain unhappy. Mm. If you do, mm. you can give me the tap back mm. and I'm going to give you your money back. Right. Yep. That, that, is, that is what we do. So as a, as, a, as a company, we don't always get things right. Yes. We make lots of mistakes. We send out the wrong items. We mm. send out stuff that doesn't work. We make mistakes. However, mm. we put those right mm. at our cost and we always make sure the customer's happy. Always. So do customers or some customers who are existing customers have got a KUKA tap at home installed and that's there's a fault, do they become so used to it they get agitated because they want it fixed like yesterday? It, it's horrendous. I call ourselves yeah. the fourth emergency service. Oh, okay. So we will have, one, one of the challenges in our business is every year we grow, mm. you put more stock into the field. Mm. In the UK, half the country's got horrific water mm. scale. Scale isn't of my making. It, it's your it's, biggest enemy. It's my biggest enemy. And the water boards dump it in my kookas every mm, day. Mm. And the customers think that's my fault. Mm. They don't go to the water boards and say, can you do me a favour? Can you give me a bit of clean water? No, they're happy for the water boards mm. to charge them with this horrendous water. Mm. That fills up the kooka and it stops them working. Mm. So what we have is a situation as we grow, mm. the demands on our service increase. Right. So we've got... 450,000 systems in the field, all of those people want a service. And if that tap breaks, mm. they want you there now. Right. So the challenge for me in my business mm. is, yeah, when I started, we, we, we had four or 500 in the field. We've got 80 odd engineers doing a couple of thousand appointments a week. Mm. Wow. And we've got to leave every single appointment where the customer's happy. Mm. And also if your tap breaks, you want me there tomorrow. Mm. You don't want to hear. Uh, we can't come tomorrow. Do you get people saying to you, oh, I haven't got a kettle? Yeah, of course we do. If the tap breaks, they want us there. Mm. They want, and, and you know, if I put myself in the place of the customer, mm. if I've invested £1,150 in a tap mm. and my tap breaks, mm. I want you there. Mm. I want you there. So we have a desire. So 2023, mm. our strategic objective mm. is to install a cooker in every house in England and Ireland. In terms of customer service, when you phone us with a complaint mm. and we put the phone down, mm. I want the engineer at your door repairing that. When we achieve that, mm. we will have a world-class service. Mm. Until then, it's work in progress. Yeah. So, Stephen, I would like to know, and I'm sure our watchers and listeners would like to know a little bit more about Stephen, the driven man. Yeah, driven, fear of failure, probably. So I, I, I treat each day each week, each month, uh, as a new day, new week, new month. So we're always looking to improve and how we improve will be determined by that day. But that, that, that's the mantra that we run here at Kukram for me as an individual. I am positive, motivated, engaged, hungry to succeed, um, driven to give a world-class service. And that, that motivates me. And, um, I'm really passionate about it. So how do you keep your motivation 10 out of 10? How are you doing that? It's an amazing place to work. So all the things I talked about, about apprentices and, and bringing youth into the business, mm -hmm. I really enjoy this. It, it, mm. it's, um, it can be tough and challenging mm. at times, but I find it exceptionally rewarding. Mm. Uh, it's a business that for me, the harder you work, the more you get from it. Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case in business. So it's, it's a business that pays you back if, if you do the right things. Mm. Mm. But I, I, I really love our industry. 
I love the people that work in it and, and it mm. motivates me. So what does the average day look like for you personally? It is a five o'clock start wow. um, and um, since June I've been jumping into an ice bath um, wow. to start my day. So it is five o'clock in the morning, straight into an ice bath now uh, for up to three minutes, which I'm just beginning to master. It is horrendous. This I is hate like it. A shock treatment, surely. This is for mindset and well-being. So okay. this has health benefits, okay. um, but it, it sets you up for the day. So it's an uncomfortable place to go. Yeah. Um, I'm constantly arguing with myself, but that's when I start my day. Mm -hmm. I then have a couple of hour gym routine. Okay. So out of the ice into the gym. Um, out of the gym into a sauna. So okay. I like to do half an hour of saunaing a day. Okay. So I have my ice treatment, my heat treatment, and a gym. Okay. That's from five till about quarter to eight. So five to quarter to eight is my time, mm. where I focus on me, mm -hmm. uh, my health, well-being, mm. um, and then I will come into the office 8.30 mm. and meet my team. Mm. Um, fulfilled days, mm. what they may entail. I spend a lot of time in different departments with the mm. team, on the road, I'm, I'm not one for sitting behind a desk and staying in the office. So should people work longer hours or work smartly? Listen, I think if you read all the textbooks, mm. you've got to have a work-life balance, mm. you have to work smart, what not you, long. What do you do? Uh, I am ridiculously obsessive with my gym routine, my work, mm. but I really enjoy it. So when I answer that question, I think for me, if you enjoy what you're doing, then there is no danger of doing too much to it. But if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then there is. So, so my work-life balance is work and gym, and I enjoy that. Um, do I switch off? Not as much as I should do, um, but I, I'm working on that. Um, but, but I enjoy it. What I've certainly found as I've become healthier, fitter, I perform better. I want them to be healthy, well, right. and fulfilled. So you're doing, so you're doing incentives. Well. Lots of different keep incentives. Yeah, all, yeah. The time, it, Perfect, all the time. Sure. All the time. All different things. But for me, it's really simple. I want to have a smile on the face. Mm. I want them to be focused and engaged at work. And the more comfortable I can make them here, mm. I, I feel that they will perform a little bit better. So. Anecdotally, we know and factually that a lot of kitchen product is now going via the tray, the tradesperson, locally to the customer. Um, how have KUKA embraced that trend and what do you do to support the tradesperson? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult area of the business because there's sometimes conflict between the independent sector and the tradesmen. Um, we treat everybody as an equal. Um, so we would look to engage with the tradesmen. We, we, we give them similar terms. Um, we support them with, a, 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 some of them don't have showrooms. Mm -hmm. So what you've seen here is our virtual platform. So if you're a tradesman and you don't have a showroom and somebody wants to see the product, they can see it at KUKA. So we would treat them all the same and it, it, it's um, a developing sector of the business mm. um, and, and one that's serving us really well. But there is, I think there's conflict within our industry between different operators, mm. uh, which I don't think is healthy and something I'd like to see mm. disappear. Okay. Yeah. So are you offering the tradesperson any additional training perhaps on insulation or how they could perhaps sell it for their customer? Yeah, we, we would give them full sales training. Okay. We would give them full installation training, but okay. also at KUKA, we'll also install it for you if you want. Right. So as a tradesman, you can sell to your customer, Yes. take all the details, pass it to me, we will go and fit it for you and pass you the margin back. And I guess, um, I guess moving back to the bricks and mortar showrooms, there's nothing better than showing it and demonstrating a tap in the flesh as it were. Yeah, the sales are enhanced threefold if somebody sees a working tap. Mm. Right. It's, yeah, threefold. Yeah, yes. And they'll always remember your showroom for it. That's the other thing. So what, what's amazing with KUKA, even if you don't sell them the KUKA, mm. show it them, because mm. they'll always remember that shop that went into this shop that showed us this, mm. this mad tap that did boiling water, chilled water, sparkling yeah. water. So mm. even, even if you're not going to sell them the mm. KUKA, mm. show it them. Mm. because they'll remember your showroom for it mm. um, and it works exce exceptionally well. Okay. And do you think, Stephen, the, the trend looking forward the next five years will be more the trade or will the trend be as it is now between the two? 
I, I think the industry is going to change. Um, I, I think potentially you, you look at the American market where appliances are sold separately. Um, we, we, we do a lot of work in, in Ireland where you see a lot of appliances sold separately. So I think the industry is, is going to go through a transformation. Okay. Um, and I think, yeah, I think potentially appliances might be dealt with differently from, from independence, but I don't think the landscape of the retail base mm. changes, but if you look at the likes of a Howden's, a Magnet's, a Wren, mm. um, or the builders merchants like the MKM, they've got a strong kitchen offer now. Mm. They're, they're, they're raising their standards, mm. which, which can only be helpful to the industry because everybody starts their journey in, in, in those type of companies. Do you think as consumers want to save more time anyway, we spoke about that before with the products, but do you think as we've all come through COVID and been trained on Zoom, Teams, whatever, do you think that would be more future selling online, the full kitchen product? I th yeah, I, I think COVID has, has benefited the online marketing and the online selling. And I, I look at our business where we struggled to get the team and Zoom platform going as a way of communicating with our dealers. Mm -hmm. Ever since COVID, that, that's a default standard form of communication. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think um, the industry has to embrace mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. I think COVID has, has learned that perhaps traveling is inefficient. Right. Visiting a showroom every time you need to meet somebody is inefficient. I think there's a balance. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of showrooms that now have closed doors mm -hmm. and you have to make an appointment. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I'm an always on, always open business. So for me, our doors are always open and we, we want people to come in. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly changed the landscape mm -hmm. for the better. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that will continue to evolve and develop. So your advice would be to a retailer, if you aren't doing that now, perhaps you should consider? Absolutely. Um, I think virtual selling, virtual meetings mm -hmm. are now commonplace. Right. Um, so not every meeting needs to be one in one. Mm -hmm. However, there's an emotion that comes from a physical mm -hmm. for meeting. You know, I've done interviews where they're remote and you get the mm -hmm. same, mm -hmm. you don't get the same feeling. So mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a place and a balance, mm -hmm. um, just like the working from home. Mm -hmm. There's a balance with that. You know, it, are we having people in the office, people mm -hmm. working from home? Mm -hmm. What's your feeling about working from home generally, Stephen? I like to come into the office, okay. um, so for me I'm an office person because I want to meet my team. Mm. I, there's, there's huge things that happen in a day just by being here, just you know, you, we talked before about coming in and saying hello to everybody. Mm. The, the odd occasion you do that, you'll spark a conversation where you end up mm. actually coming up with a, a business solution or, mm. or fixing something. So I think for me, I'm an office person, I want to get out of the house and into the office. Mm. However, I'm, I'm, I'm Modern in my thinking, mm. there is clearly a desire for individuals to work at home. Mm. Um, the, the challenge for me is ensuring that you get mm. the, the work ethic mm -hmm. and the work done. Mm -hmm. And in practice, for me, the people that have worked from home mm. deliver a good quality and standard of work. Mm. But for culture purposes mm. and team building mm. and the business and, and what is Cooper? I think you all need to be together. You've got to be together. And on that on that subject, could you be for the future an advocate of a four day week potentially? That is a good question. Mm. And it's funny because we're just going to a seven day week at Kuka. So one of our challenges in the business is as we grow, mm -hmm. how do we service our clients? Customer centric. Customer centric. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't have our phones on on a Saturday and Sunday or evenings. Mm -hmm. And we sat as a team and we thought, is that good? Mm -hmm. Is that what our customers want? And no. Mm -hmm. So actually as a business next year, our customer service department and sales departments are going to go into a seven day cycle okay. where we'll have people working from a Wednesday to a Sunday. Yeah. And then the, the other people do them on a rotor. Yeah. So for me, I want to, the customer centric and therefore we, we have to be available for our mm -hmm. customers at the times that they want us to be. I guess, I guess you could rotor that, but where I'm coming from, is it better or is it smart? for people to, to work less hours but be more productive potentially? I don't time manage my people. Right. So I don't time manage. Yes, they've got a contract. Okay. Um, I don't time manage them. So for me, if, you know, if my, t I have really loose control of Sam because I trust them. Mm -hmm. And 
I think in practice you could achieve what you do in a five day week and a four day week, absolutely no problem. No problem. You know, when you actually evaluate what somebody achieves in a day, if you actually look at it from nine in the morning till five in the evening, there's probably a good couple of hours working all of that, where you can say that's tangible, that, that, that's worked. I think the challenge comes in areas, customer service, where phone calls, you know, they're coming in all day, aren't they? So you have to fill, if I want to give a four day week in my customer service, you know, we had a training event last week where we closed the office for two days. We got absolutely hammered on social media, hammered because we closed our office. So there's a balance, there's, there's for me, quality of life for my staff mm -hmm. yes. and serving my customers. Mm -hmm. And if we can achieve that with a four day week mm -hmm. and achieve what we want and get the right balance, mm -hmm. bring it on. Mm -hmm. But I think it's balance. Yeah. From a manufacturer's perspective, what do you think is good or excellent or world-class customer service? What does that mean? From a manufacturer to the retailer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think mm. that is a really interesting question because we've come the back of um, mm. our shortages mm -hmm. where lots of retailers have suffered horrendously mm -hmm. because they can't get stock of appliances. Mm. Um, and, and what I've seen from that is communication is absolutely key and essential. And everybody being responsible for their own areas of the business. So for me as a manufacturer, mm. and I can only speak about myself, we've been really fortunate that our um, production facility invested significantly in what we needed to ensure we were always in stock yeah. throughout COVID and the yeah. cost of living and the sh shortages. Yeah. So as a business, we've always been in stock and always been able to deliver. And I take that responsibility really seriously because mm. if you're my customer, mm. You expect me to have the stock. That was, that's my responsibility to you. Mm -hmm. So as a manufacturer, we take, we take our responsibility seriously. I think, unfortunately, other manufacturers have been faced with horrendous problems. So why don't you think that KUKA has suffered? We made some good decisions early on. We invested millions and millions and millions into stock and product mm -hmm. to ensure that we could service our customers. It, well, it's very much like the price of our product. We've not increased the price of our product for the last five years. Okay, we've, because we don't feel that the retailers are in a position where they can afford to pay more. So for us, if we can sell more taps, mm we can achieve our growth and achieve our margin. So we fixed our prices. We wanna make the, de the dealers are central to what we do. And, mm. and it's really interesting, we firmly, so every decision mm. we make is based on our dealers. Mm. And we really do it. Mm. We really, really do it. Mm. And I think other manufacturers have struggled. Mm. Um, and it, I, I don't think it's been as simple for them as investing in stock because I think they've been deprived of being able to get it. Mm. But I suppose, if I had a criticism of other manufacturers is they've left dealers high and dry. Mm -hmm. Some of the stories I hear are horrendous. Mm -hmm. And it's a time where we should all be helping each other and there should be understanding from both parts. So for me, if I short delivered something to you and you'd finish fitting that kitchen, I would send one of my engineers to finish and fit it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to give, for me a world-class service is not having you inconvenience. Mm -hmm. And I think manufacturers in our industry mm -hmm need to start to look at yeah. giving a service to the dealers so that is world class. What you're saying, if it goes wrong, your advice, if it goes wrong, do something above and beyond to put that right. Stand behind your product. product. It's clear what your responsibilities are. Yeah. Really clear to me. If I don't deliver a tap to you on time mm. and you finish that kitchen, mm. then you've got to send an engineer, a fitter back, mm. to fit that tap. That's, that's not fair for yeah. you. So for me, our responsibilities are really clear. Mm. Um, again, if a tap breaks, I have my own engineers that I would send. I don't just send you a part and say fix it. So for me, I want service to be a turnkey experience where we take care of everything. I really know what our responsibilities are, so do you. And I think our industry as a whole, both manufacturers and retailers, have to improve the customer experience. Think about the customer, because the customer with a hole where the oven's missing, or the door's missing, or the fit is not turned up, or we can't fit the kitchen, is an unhappy customer. That is not beneficial for anybody. So, so what, what we're saying here is you say, if it goes wrong, it's all about communication, putting your hand up and giving options. Yeah, put it right. Mm. Apologize, sorry, mm. we made a mistake, mm. or if you've got a problem, be honest. Mm. If 
they've got something time sensitive at the end of that because they could have fitters arranged or anything. We will then look to make that right. Mm. And I want us as an, in as an industry to do that. I want us to embrace each other and not fight mm. because I think together we can be a bit better and stronger and improve mm. what we do. And I don't think anybody sets out not to deliver an oven, no. not to deliver a hob, not to deliver a microwave, or, or not to be able to fit your kitchen. They don't want to do that. Yep. Circumstances. Yep. So positive communication. Positive communication. And mm -hmm. be responsible for your own actions. And if you have an issue in your business that's going to affect somebody else, explain it to them. And, and don't make sure they're not out of pocket for it. I feel really, really, really strongly about that. Keeping that customer and that customer loyalty is also equally as important as getting that new customer. What do you do here to increase your customer loyalty? More important, I, I talk to my staff all the time about okay. customer retention. Yes. Um, and I think as a, as a country and an industry, we're obsessed with getting a new customer, mm. but actually mm. we've got lots of existing customers that can mm. fulfill what we need. So mm. we work tirelessly with our existing customers to ensure they feel valued. We're trying to break the 80-20 rule. What we, we don't want 80-20, we want all our customers to have similar experiences, yeah. um, be treated in the same way, mm. and we want them to evolve in the same way, but it's challenging and it, it's difficult, mm. but, but that's the focus we will have on it. What sort of methods could a manufacturer adopt generically to, do you think, Stephen, to increase customer retention? I think service is key, right. defining what that, customer wants mm -hmm. and making sure you deliver on it mm -hmm. and building a relationship and I think if you can do that and deliver on that service then the relationships work they're, they're integral mm -hmm. absolutely integral but I, I do think as an industry we, we have a long way to come on service mm -hmm. a long long way mm -hmm. do you think that your your sales team are leading the way in terms of the overall customer proposition do you think that's what you're doing or do you think you could be better I, th I think we can be f far better than we are. Um, constant improvement, and I, I talked before about us achieving what we want to achieve will be when the we answer the phone within the second it rings, right. and you put that phone down as a customer, we're at your door repairing that product. That, to me, is perfection. Mm. And if we achieve that, mm. we can all stand and give ourselves a mm. round of applause, mm. and we've done well. Mm -hmm. Until we reach that point, I think we can continually improve the customer journey. The, mm. the challenge for us as a business is when I started, I used to supply a tap, they didn't have any fizz, any sparkling, any chilled, any gas, any... They used to give you a tap, mm. say thank you very much, mm. it's going to work, you don't need to do anything with it, and I've seen about 10 years. Mm. What's, what's different with our business now is because the pro how the product evolves, our touch point with the customer might be four, five, six times a year. Mm. So the customer buys the product, and they have to have a, a, an experience through purchase. Mm -hmm. We then process it and fit it, and they've got to have a good experience with that installer. Mm. And it could be the fourth install on a day. It could be in London, climbing a penthouse with a cube. It could be 20 kilos of stuff. So his last job at four o'clock on a Friday, we want him happy with the customer. We want him, when he's fitted it, to show the customer how to use it. Thereafter that's done, the customer is gonna want gas from us, servicing. So that customer might phone us four or five times through that year. Every single time that customer phones, we've got to be as good as we were on the first call. Because if we're not, mm. you get the criticism. Mm. Cooker are amazing when they want to sell you something, but try and order gas, mm. and the gas will take three weeks to come. And so the challenge for me it's in the consistent. business, consistent, that's your word, yeah. consistent throughout the whole process. Mm. Okay. And that's how our business has changed. So understanding mm. that the person dealing with the CO2 returns or the, mm. the scale control returns when speaking to you mm. as a customer has to put that customer front of house. Mm. You know, so if we've not got your cylinders back, mm. we need to talk to you in a way that we get them back. So really difficult I I I in relation to that. Okay, so, so looking ahead now to 2023, so what's your vision of the KBB marketplace? Are we going to be pent up demand continue? Are we going to be in recession? Are we going to be coming out quickly? What do you feel for next year? I think there is some pent-up demand because of shortages and lack of labour. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a falseness in saying there is 
a pent up demand because I think we've created that due to the delays in the supply chain. Mm. I think next year more than ever, we're gonna have to sell and, and give people reason to invest. Mm. And I think mm. the cost of living crisis and sustainability mm. gives us an opportunity to do that. Mm. But I see it as potentially a, a more difficult year because of the amount of negative press that's around. Mm. You, and you turn on the news, mm. it's war, it's cost of living. Mm. I think the news channels have, have a desire to fill mm. us with yeah, horrendous news all the time. Mm. I think if you, if you take that away as an industry... Will we go to? I think there's there's enough business there for mm. us all. I, I think recession in our industry, we've always done well. Mm. I look back at the financial crisis. I look back at previous crashes in my old business. We've always done well out of it. Mm. Always done well. Mm. So I, I live in hope that we mm. will benefit from it. So what you're I, saying is take a take a negative, but turn it into positive and be even better. Yeah. You, we've got an opportunity to sell sustainability here. Mm. So the, the whole world is talking about sustainability. Mm. The cost of living crisis mm. has put a focus on sustainability. Mm. So as an industry, let's use it. Mm. Let's sell the sustainability story mm. back to mm. our customers. Because if mm. we do that well, they're going to buy and invest a bit more. Well, what, what do you think uh, some advice could be to an independent retailer that says, actually, Stephen, there's less people coming in and they, they fold their arms? What would you say to that retailer? I think you have to be driven, motivated, open your doors and fight for business. Um, I think if you sit in the shop waiting for people to come to you, mm -hmm. you, you can be waiting. Mm -hmm. I would encourage people to advertise. Okay. You know, in difficult times, I hear lots of companies that say, we're not advertising. For me, advertise more. Mm -hmm. If it's a tough market, mm -hmm. you have to get your voice to be heard. Spend money, market, advertise. Mm -hmm. Drive your business more than ever in difficult times. You've got to promote yourself. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget, even in a recession, mm. there's over a million kitchens a year sold, mm -hmm. and there's 26 million households in the UK, and mm. I think there's three million millionaires. There's enough for me there. It's just who's getting it. You've got to get Make sure you get it. Be the one that wins it. We, we will win our business. So if we look at next year, we're going to grow next year. 150% we will <clears throat> grow, because mm. we will win more business than mm. others, and we'll win more business than others through hard work and making sure the customer is centric to what we do. So if we make the customer centric to what we do, mm. there's a chance that they'll tell their friends about us mm. and more people will come and buy Kukas. Mm. And that's our, that will be our strategy for next year. So message to everybody is have a positive attitude. And work hard, have a story, mm. work hard, sell yourself, mm. look for your customers. Brilliant, that's great advice. Stephen Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you very me. much, that was really thank enjoyable. You. If you'd like to subscribe, you can hit the subscribe button. If you'd like to receive notifications of future movers and shakers, you can hit the bell icon, or you can subscribe to any of our social media channels where we like to give back to the industry. So thanks for watching, guys, and thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much.